Okay, and we should be live here now. Uh, welcome to Thoughtful Money, folks. I'm Thoughtful Money founder and your host, Adam Taggart. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're having a, a special uh, interview today, a special live one. Um, and the topic is, uh, we've just had these uh, this escalation of hostilities in the Middle East. Now, Iran uh, has, has actually uh, taken some kinetic action against Israel. We had uh, a drone and ballistic missile attack over the weekend. Uh, I know a lot of people are obviously concerned about this development. Um, hearing from a lot of people, they don't really know what exactly is going on in this part of the world. They don't really have a, a, a huge background in, in the history between uh, Iran and Israel. Um, and of course, there's lots of inflammatory headlines out there about, you know, is World War III just started? So I wanted to try to get a very impartial, highly experienced uh, view for us all into just what's going on there and what we should be paying attention to. And very kindly, uh, we're being joined today by Ryan Bowl, who is the uh, senior Middle East and North, Amer uh, North Africa analyst for Rain Network. Uh, Rain Network is a geopolitical risk advisory service. If you're familiar with the uh, the company Stratfor, Rain has uh, also acquired Stratfor. It's it's part of that constellation. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, well, thank you, Adam, for for having me. I'm I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you jumping on with short notice too. I think it was like late in the day on Saturday when I reached out to Rain and voila, almost 48 hours later, you're here. So thank you for doing that. So um, I've got some general questions here, but the, the general arc of this discussion is gonna be, uh, how do we get here? <laughs> um, what exactly is happening now? Mm -hmm. And to the last question is, is how concerned should we be about uh, where things are headed here? So, um, if, if, if that arc sounds okay with you, can we just start with you explaining the drivers of the tensions between Iran and Israel? Yeah, and, and um, there's a, I will say with a caveat, any conflict in the Middle East, particularly things surrounding Israel, involve an awful lot of history, and I'm going to be skipping over a lot of that. And, and so I don't want anybody to feel like I, I, I'm trying to be remiss or glib or too short with, uh, with what is a very complicated region um, with a lot of events. So let's just start with which makes the most sense for uh, understanding Israel and Iran. Uh, once upon a time, they were uh, part of the U.S. Uh, security alliance in the Middle East against the Soviet Union. Then there was a revolution in Iran, as we all know, in 1979 that switched Iran's ideology from pro-Western to this Islamist uh, third uh, way kind of ideology that involved a very strong pro-Palestinian stance. Um, and that meant that naturally Iran would be from that point on uh, an, uh, a longtime rival of Israel. And that's where that relationship's deeper drivers were uh, come from, that, that conflict. And, and since then, um, as a result of that revolution, uh, Iran lost its, its most important defense partner, the United States. You know, most of its air force is still from the 60s and 70s, from back when the U.S. and, the, and Iran were, were friendly. And so Iran adapted to that circumstance. And the way they adapted to that circumstance was by developing asymmetric capabilities, drones, rockets, missiles, uh, and a series of proxies of, of militias in places like Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, which for very many different historical reasons all developed on their own terms uh, and have become either directly controlled by Iran or uh, natural allies of Iran, uh, or in some cases, just fellow travelers, people whose interests are overlapping with Iran. And so Iran, um, has this adversarial relationship with Israel, uh, which makes it so that the, we see these sorts of conflicts come and go over the years. Um, and Israel perceives from Iran um, a combination of an existential threat. They believe that Iran's uh, revolutionary regime is, is out to destroy uh, Israel. That's not helped by uh, Iranian politicians every once in a while <clears throat> promising to make that happen. Um, they also see the security threats from Iran's militias on its border, Hezbollah in Lebanon, various militias in Syria, the Houthis in, in Yemen, those are security threats as well. And Israel also has its own sort of right-leaning, It's right now its government is the, the most far right-leaning government in its history, but they also have this position where there's not a lot of compromise that can be made between Israel and Iran, particularly on the Palestinian issue. So that's kind of like a bigger, broader dynamics. And again, skipping over a lot of history there, uh, but that's the biggest, most essential part of the relationship, I think that's important to understand. All right, I, I appreciate that, and I know it's it's a challenge to to condense decades and decades of of lots of history, uh, recent history, into you know such a concise description. But I think you did really well. So, what brought us to the point of Saturday? 
when Iran decided to actually take a, you know, a, a more kinetic position here? So uh, for about the past decade, essentially since the Arab Spring happened, uh, Israel has been much more assertive about this shadow war that it's fighting with Iran. And what that shadow war has looked like is assassinations inside of Iran, bombing Iranian allies in places like Syria and, and Lebanon and occasionally Iraq as well, uh, carrying out all these operations that Israel doesn't usually claim. Um, and, and that has led to an unstable dynamic between them, but it's, it's led to a a relationship where both sides understand the rules of engagement. Iran responds through proxies, Israel strikes in third party countries like, like Syria, and that's where their conflict was staying for a long time. Uh, up until October 7th, when Hamas launched its sudden attack on, on southern Israel uh, and carried out all the, the actions, the atrocities that they did there, and that started the Gaza War. Well, Iran naturally had to back Hamas's position in the Gaza War, uh, but Iran had no interest in going directly to war uh, with Israel. And still has no direct interest in going to war with, with Israel, given its conventional inferiority against the Israelis. They don't have as good of an air force. They certainly don't have the allies that that uh, Israel does, like the United States. Um, and, and, and at that moment, Israel's government became considerably more hawkish, as one might expect after an assault like October 7th. Just as the U.S. became more hawkish after 9-11, so too did the Israelis. And the Israelis began to escalate their covert war against Iran. And on April 1st, what that resulted in was an attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, which was an area where Iran was coordinating its militias and its responses to Israel. And they killed several senior military leaders of the of the Iranian, uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, uh, which is the elite part of the military, the best funded part of it, and the one that's responsible both for um, its kind of hawkish ideology, uh, but also responsible for most of the, the coordinated attacks on Israel. And when that happened, Iran saw it as an attack directly on their soil. There's a debate about whether or not that was, but they saw it as an attack on their soil and they decided they had to respond with a direct attack on Israel itself. And it took them, you know, 12 days to make the decision of, of how they were going to launch this attack uh, and to coordinate with their allies to do so. Uh, but on Saturday, we finally saw that manifested after an awful lot of telegraph uh, telegramming in, uh, from, uh, from Tehran that they were going to do that in response to the April 1st attack. Okay, and uh, folks watching, um, I should have mentioned at the beginning that uh, you know I'm going through this list of prepared questions, but then we'll be taking questions from the live audience. So as you have questions here for Ryan, please ask them in the live chat and I'll start pulling from that in a little bit. Um, so Ryan, um, uh, and, and I'm trying to do this with as, um, you know, a nonpartisan level of inquiry as I can. Um, when when Israel attacked the Iranian consulate that then sparked Iran's response here, um, uh, how much support did it have uh, from its geopolitical allies for that? Was was that seen as something that was understandable and and defensible, or was that seen as as more of a more aggressive action than than its allies would have liked to have seen? Um, I, I would say that the, uh, the U.S. in particular and, and Britain uh, did not welcome that strike. Uh, and we've seen leaks from Biden administration officials saying that they didn't think it was a very strategic strike, that it was escalatory. Um, they weren't asked. Uh, they don't have to be asked. That Israel is an independent nation capable of carrying out covert action unilaterally and does uh, an awful lot. And, and as a result, uh, we saw some turbulence in that relationship over that. But that's not the same as, as having the United States say, well, we're not going to defend Israel. We're not going to we're going to cut off Israeli arms. There's definitely talk of that uh, within the White House and, of course, within the wider Democratic Party, and especially amongst the base. We've seen activists demanding that an awful lot since the beginning of the Gaza war. Uh, but certainly this was an escalatory step that the, the West did not welcome. Uh, but at the same time, they also did not welcome Iran's response. And I, I think maybe one of the more useful ways we can think about this conflict is that the U.S has limited interests in the Middle East, and particularly in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. America's primary interest in this conflict is security and stability. They don't care necessarily how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolves itself, whether that's a one-state solution where Israel takes over the whole territory, two-state solution where they divide it up, something in between where Israel is managing things. The U.S. doesn't really have an opinion or an interest in that. What it does have an interest in is security for Israel, in part because it's a close ally, but also because it is a nuclear weapons power and an escalation scenario that gets out of control uh, between a nuclear armed power and a power like Iran. That's clearly something the United States doesn't welcome. And, and, and how much, if at all, in the U.S.'s stance there for wanting security is also um, 
we have strong interests in the Middle East from an energy standpoint, and um, we just don't want a conflagration there to to basically interrupt our you know the supplies of oil that 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 we still depend on to a certain extent. Exactly. That, that that's another big part of it. If it is real, and we are waiting for Israel's potential retaliation for this attack on on, on April thirteenth. What the United States doesn't want is for this to escalate into tit for tat, where they're firing missiles at each other and attacking each other through airstrikes, to the point where the Iranians feel compelled to start to squeeze the Strait of Hormuz uh, more than they already have, and and to start to interrupt energy supplies to carry out a campaign similar to what the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea, which is causing havoc for supply chains and and uh, international commerce. The U.S. doesn't want that. They want the from the American kind of dream policy would be that everybody just resolves these issues on their own and, and, and walks away and de-escalates on their own. But they all have local drivers, local conflicts that they are interested in uh, resolving in their favor. Uh, and that's creating this, di- this dilemma for the United States. Um, on a wider sense, uh, the U.S. is also, there's war in Europe. Uh, there is the potential of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. The U.S. is aware of these massive strategic shifts that are happening globally. And the U.S. is not remilitarizing the way that we did during World War II. There's only so many arms that can go in so many places, so many jets and so many pilots, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so the U.S. is picking and choosing. And it's trying to stay out of the Middle East as much as it can. And that helps explain some of the behavior that we have seen. Because if the U.S. picks a side too strongly and tries to force a country like Iran or Israel or anybody else to go against their own core interests, they know that that's, that increases the risk of the U.S. being drawn back into a region it's trying to draw down from so it can focus on Europe and, and Asia. Okay, so now is where we get in the danger of the questions just start multiplying from here. Um, so you, you said that while the U.S. and Great Britain, um, you know, weren't weren't totally on board with the Israeli strike on the consulate, uh, they did actively participate in the defense of Israel um, as the drones and ballistic missiles were coming in. Um, so uh, to a certain extent, they are at least maintaining their, you know, sort of historic support uh, for, for Israel here. Um, I, I, I'm the wrong guy to be saying stuff like this, but I, I saw coverage of Biden reaching out to uh, Iran, I think before Iran did its launch and said, hey, don't retaliate for uh, that consulate bombing. And of course, Iran decided to to then um, attack Israel. I, I think I've seen similar reports where Biden administration has told Israel, hey, like be measured in your response, like don't escalate this thing. Um, and some of the reports that I read, and of course, this is all fog of war, mm-hmm. is that, oh, well, you know, Iran actually called Turkey and they kind of got kind of pre-approval for what they could do. And, and you know, the drone attack was mostly for show than for real destruction. And so there's sort of a, a sense that this is kind of orchestrated kabuki theater so that each party can show its own populace, that it's standing tough, but it's not really going after each other. But then again, this morning, I think there are headlines that Israel, which headlines a day ago saying were considered being more measured and moderate, given that there wasn't much damage to now, all of a sudden, you know, the Warhawks uh, in the Knesset are saying, no, we need to be forceful. So what's the danger here of this tit for tat escalation where it just becomes a Hatfield and McCoy thing where for every injury you got to do a bigger response and it keeps building. Yeah, that's and that I think is the the biggest, most dangerous implication of the current circumstances that both sides can be drawn into this tit for tat exchange that is not really directly in either of their strategic interests. It's in their political interests to respond to one another. It's not necessarily in their wider strategic interests. The the Iranians um, know that they are not going to destroy the state of Israel. They're not going to invade Israel. That's not where they want to go. Um, they know that they couldn't necessarily win that conflict. The Israelis, for that matter, uh, would like to see a revolution in Iran, but they don't want to do all of the the, the, am- the amount of uh, the economic costs alone of just the Gaza war uh, have been enormous for Israel. So they, they also have no interest in a deep and long and sustained escalation. But every time somebody violates somebody else's airspace or causes damage on the ground, that does um, pull these governments back into having to respond to one another. And so what we're watching for, and this is what's been interesting about Iranian behavior over the years, the U.S. and Iran came very close to overt war in, in early 2020 after the uh, the U.S. assassination of, of IRGC and Quds Force head uh, Qasem Soleimani. Um, the U.S. decided not to counterstrike after Iran fired its missiles at the U.S. airbase because there were no overt casualties. There was a lot of wounded folks, a lot of brain injuries, but there was nobody killed. 
And so the politics of the moment didn't conspire to force the U.S. to get dragged into an air war against the Iranians that certainly at that time the U.S. about to enter election season uh, had no interest in. Um, in January, we saw Iran and Pakistan fire missiles at one another um, over a, a, an ISIS-K attack, uh, the Islamic State Khorasan uh, province attack inside of Iran that, that uh, Iran blamed on militants based in Pakistan. So they fired their missiles, they got it out of their systems, and they climbed back down. And I think a lot of diplomats, a lot of policymakers are hoping this moment will be similar, uh, that they can both just carry out their exchanges uh, without causing substantial damage to one another, and they can step back and get back on the de-escalation path. The problem with that hope, the problem with that assumption is that both sides are locked into this ideological trajectory where conflict between them only becomes more likely over time. You know, if the Israelis are going to continue the military campaign in Gaza, and they will, uh, Iran must act as a defender of Palestinian interests. That means it must be in conflict with Israel in some capacity. Um, the Israelis are looking at invading southern Lebanon to establish a buffer zone there. Um, against Iran's ally, Hezbollah. Iran would have to respond to that as well. So there's all of these pulls that, in spite of the fact that at the moment neither side wants this big fight and they do want to have a kind of saving face in, in terms for their, their own public, um, their deeper strategic drivers are pulling them back into conflict. Okay, and th this may be a really naive question here, but l let's assume for a second it's just an Israel versus Iran matchup. Right, the rest of the world is all sitting out of it. Who has the stronger military here? Like, is 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 it a? I mean, obviously Israel is a nuclear power, so they've got that sort of trump card. But um, are, are they somewhat evenly matched militarily, or is it more one-sided in one direction? On a, on a conventional sense, certainly the Israelis are more one-sided. Their their air force uh, would be capable of of overcoming Iran's air defenses in in relatively short order. The the Iranian air defenses are reliant on older Russian systems like the S three hundred air defense system, which we've seen being used a lot in Ukraine, kind of ineffectively. It's it's a Soviet made system. It's old, um, <clears throat> and they'd be able to overcome that. I believe the Iranians have <clears throat> orders for more advanced Russian air defenses, but Russian air defenses, as we've seen in Europe. Are, are not enough to block the, the Israelis. So if they moved into that space from a uh, operational standpoint, the Israelis would be able to take control of the airspace over Iran, probably disable or destroy most of its air defenses and strike whatever targets they want. But from that point on, they're kind of stuck like the US was with Iraq in the 90s, where the US had done the same thing to Saddam Hussein, destroyed the air defenses, they could attack at will. Saddam's government only got stronger domestically under that attack. Um, because people rally to the flag when they're under attack by a foreigner. So the hopes of having internal regime change in Iraq uh, declined to zero. And that would probably be the case with Iran as well. And you'd have a population that would rally to the Islamic Republic, become loyal supporters when a lot of them are currently very angry at the way the government has been running things economically. Inflation is out of control. <clears throat> a lot of basic infrastructure doesn't work. There's a huge amount of corruption and, and uh, nobody can vote. Nobody can speak out. There's been the hijab protests. Uh, but if Israel begins an overt campaign, it would strengthen that government. And no air war by itself has been successful in strategically changing the behavior of an adversary. You have air wars that are important component of wars, but the U.S. in Vietnam, the U.S. over Iraq, the U.S. over, you know, the, the, what the Russians are trying to do in Ukraine right now, unless air power is coupled with a political and ground strategy, um, you end up being stuck in these struggles where your enemy is dodging your bombs and, and dodging you back and forth and you're just building supporters and new generations of supporters uh, for your rival. And Iran would be able to carry out an extended uh, reply, you know, retaliation campaign of drones and rockets and missiles across Israel. And at a certain point, Israel's air defenses would start to fail and no longer have the ammunition needed to intercept all of those. And then Israel starts to face much more significant kinetic damage uh, on its soil. Okay, and my hypothetical question was sort of an isolated conflict between Israel and Iran. I'm guessing you tell me th that is highly likely not going to be isolated in the sense that everybody has their alliances. And so, would such a would, would, if it really went kinetic between the two um, in a more substantial way than we've had so far, would it really kind of pull the rest of the world into this? Probably not, but it would pull in the region and it would pull in energy security in a way that is significant for the rest of the world. So Iran's proxies all and, and allies exist 
to serve as a layer of deterrence for the Iranians. Hezbollah is in southern Lebanon and gets Iranian money and Iranian arms so that it can be something like a they can uh, the Iranians can pull the trigger of Hezbollah, which has a huge rocket arsenal. And rockets, I don't know, you know, this is a this is a, a, a little bit of a missile nerd thing, but rockets are cheap to make. They don't have any guidance systems. You can make them in a factory in your backyard if you can avoid blowing yourself up. Um, and they are far cheaper than the Iron Dome system uh, that would be able to intercept them. So Hezbollah could just keep churning out these rockets, firing them into northern Israel, uh, and eventually breaking Israel's air defenses by just sheerly overwhelming it. And so we would have these proxies saturating Israel with these attacks. Um, but if we're seeing an, an air war between Israel and Iran taking place, but of course, of course, they don't share a, a ground border. Iran's navy is almost non-existent. Israel's navy is advanced, but it's very small. So neither side is going to carry out an amphibious invasion of the other. Um, as they're doing this and they're carrying out this war at a distance, um, you know, through the air largely, uh, that then leads to the possibility that Iran realizes one of its best ways to force Israel to halt its campaign is to squeeze the global economy. And that's where they could resume attacks on Saudi Arabia, on the United Arab Emirates, on oil facilities in these countries. Um, they could try to close the Strait of Hormuz. And they don't actually have to close the whole Strait of Hormuz. All they have to do is threaten it enough that tankers stop using it, um, that, that oil companies decide it's not worth it. So all they have to do is, see, they already seized one container ship right before this attack. That was a signal that the Strait of Hormuz is in play. Um, and, and so they can squeeze that to try to get that 20% of the world's oil supply to be rattled. And then you see oil prices spike and you could have an energy shock that is far worse than what you saw after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and that sort of threat of an energy shock could be enough to convince the United States with its substantial military leverage over Israel to call a halt to it. Because it's very important to note, without US support, uh, the Israeli Air Force can't fly. Um, they don't have any uh, abilities to replace parts. They don't have the ability to replace weapons. Um, they require U.S. logistical support for things like hardware and software for, for their more advanced fighters. If the U.S. says you need to call a halt to this campaign, uh, the Israelis really don't have much of a choice uh, other than to, to call a halt to it. Okay. And, and what is the U.S.'s current appetite for increased support to Israel for actions against Iran right now? Um, one, because of you know, there's there is some growing blowback. We're seeing all the demonstrations across the world, but certainly just a rash of them yesterday, even here in the states, uh, pro-Palestinian. Um, but also, we've been supporting this massive war in Ukraine, and you know, even before this latest flare-up between Iran and, and Israel, there were you know there are lots of there's lots of political resistance to continuing uh, to provide that kind of support for a foreign war. So. Mm -hmm. Is our appetite cooling or, hey, we're on Team Israel all the time, no matter what? I, I think it is. It is definitely cooling. It's not. It's cooling um, for offensive support for Israel. The ability for Israel to carry out more unilateral action. I think there's a lot more skepticism of that than there was, say, 12 months ago. And I think that will deepen the longer this conflict draws out. There's still an awful lot of support for defensive support for Israel. So resupplying its air defenses, um, coordinating with regional allies to, to carry out the shoot downs like on Saturday. Israel has a very strong defensive alliance of, 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 of big powers like the United States and little powers like Jordan, you know, that, that Jordan is very angry about the Gaza war, but it also doesn't want to be a vector for Iranian missiles to cross into Israel. And it doesn't want to see Israel hit by Iranian missiles because Jordan also uh, fears Iran and, and its Iranian influence in the region. So Israel has a very strong defensive political backing from its allies and strategic backing. It's losing its offensive backing from these powers. And, you know, because again, Israel is so, its air force is so reliant on the United States and it doesn't have any backups in, in, the, in the foreseeable future for that U.S. partnership. If the United States starts to caveat its arms sales to uh, Israel and say that they can't be used for X, Y, and Z, um, the IAF won't really have much choice but to accept those conditions uh, so that they can continue to carry out their defensive operations, which at the end of the day, that, that that's certainly going to be more important for the Israelis than their ability to carry out retaliations against Iran. Okay. And, and where does where does Russia fit in all this? I know historically they're an ally of Iran, but there's also a lot of uh, Russian, you know, Jewish connections uh, with Israel. Um so are they are, are they a one-sided partner here? Are they just team Iran or is it more nuanced for them? Yeah, it's definitely more nuanced where the Iranian, where the Russians are trying to, of course, they're trying to make the United States look bad diplomatically, which they've been doing again and again at the UN votes. Every time there's a ceasefire vote, 
Russia's in favor of it. If the U.S. has to block it uh, for the Gaza war, then the U.S. loses credibility in what we kind of refer to as the, the global south uh, amongst countries like South Africa, Brazil, et cetera. Uh, Russia has been doing that a lot where they, they're trying to make themselves out like they're a peacemaker, which, of course, is superbly um, uh, ballsy of them to do, given what they're doing in, in Ukraine. Uh, but they want to play peacemaker as much as possible in the Gaza war, while at the same time showing that they are a credible defense partner uh, to Iran. That's tricky because Russia is going full tilt in Ukraine and is, you know, it's making some gains, especially recently. But a lot of the Russian military is is quite frankly busy. And so they can't actually be a credible defense partner for the Iranians um, the way that the United States can be a credible defense partner uh, for Israel. So if Israel strikes Iran proper to, and we end up in a more of a regional conflict, the U.S. will be involved. The Russians won't. The Russians will have an involvement on a diplomatic level. They will try to de-escalate the situation. They will try to take credit for peacemaking uh, moves uh, around the region. But we won't see Russian troops rush to the region the way that, you know, 1973, when Egypt and Israel went to war, there was a very real threat that the Soviet Union was about to send troops to, to Egypt to back the Egyptians, which is part of why the Americans were backing the, the Israelis at the time is because they were anti-Soviet. Um, that won't happen this time around. Uh, the, the Russians are too constrained by their own neighborhood to have much of an effect. Um, and so that, that's where they, they that's where they're going to they'll act rhetorically on a military and economic level. They will try to remain as neutral as possible or, you know, not act at all. OK. All right. Well, let's get to the big question then, which is so what do you think is most likely to happen from here? So all of that has to be caveated, I'm afraid, um, with if this and then that. So <clears throat> Israel, I believe, will respond to the attack on Saturday. They they really don't have a political choice. They have to respond in some capacity. Uh, the least risky, most often seen reaction that they could give, a lot of airstrikes in Syria, um, even hitting the Iranian embassy again, uh, anything like that, would still stay within a certain paradigm box uh, that would allow escalation to be limited to what's going on in Syria. They could expand those strikes to Lebanon against Hezbollah or against the Iranian assets there. They could go after Iraq as well, which they haven't bombed in a long time, but they did bomb them in, in 2019 where they hit some Iranian militias there. They could even go farther afield to Yemen, where the, the U.S., of course, is attacking the Houthi movement there. Uh, but they could expand target sets to, to Yemen to showcase that they, that they will punish even further afield uh, rivals like the Houthis that are right now quite a distance for a lot of Israeli jets to get to. Um, that's the least risky, is to, stri is to strike back in the proxy theaters, um, because they do that already. And the Iranians don't necessarily have to respond to that, although they're suggesting that they might. Um, but it may not be enough, because right now, the world that Israel is looking at is one in which if Iran gets intensely focused enough on a certain Israeli policy, they will be tempted to launch another barrage at Israel to see if they can get Israel to change its behavior. So if they don't like, you know, Israel's invasion of southern Lebanon, Iran right now, it would be a safe assumption to assume that they would they would fire more or another barrage at Israel to try to stop them from that southern uh, Lebanon invasion. If Israel carries out a certain airstrike in Syria, another barrage could come. If Israel has a certain policy towards the Palestinians, for example, if there's an uprising in the West Bank, um, another barrage can come. So Israel is trying to send the message to Iran that barrages have consequences. And the consequence that you can get most direct towards is a direct strike on Iran itself in some capacity. So, sorry to interrupt, but, but is that a credible expectation uh, on Iran's side? Because I would think not being nearly as knowledgeable as you about this dynamic, that Israel would do everything in its power not to ever show that it could be bullied into changing a policy by a barrage, because then you just invite future barrages every time they don't like a current policy of yours. Exactly. So already <clears throat> the current status quo is Israeli covert action now has a price to be paid directly from Iran itself. <clears throat> Israel wants to go back to the paradigm where there's no consequences from Iran itself. They'll put up with proxy replies, they'll put up with attacks from the Houthis, they'll put up with Hamas in a certain level and they'll retaliate against them. What they want is that Iran, they don't want Iran to be convinced that Iran itself is so untouchable and so off limits for the Israeli Air Force um, that in the future they can carry out, they can repeat these strikes. So there's a bit of paranoia that goes into this, but this is also how deterrence works because deterrence is never a clear communications model. It's not always fully rational in the way that um, that might be expected if everybody had access to all the full information. Um, the Israelis are going to assume that the Iranians are emboldened and believe that they can do this again. The Iranians are going to assume that Israel 
uh, if they don't launch the attack on, uh, if they don't launch any kind of reply on, on Iran, the Iranians will assume that they have a freer hand to try to reshape I Israeli behavior, because in a sense they will. They will have reshaped Israeli deterrence doctrine if there's no reply at all. But Israel is very clear that they reply for attacks on their soil. Um, if there's no reply for this attack, it means Israeli doctrine has, has um, you know, implicitly changed. Um, and so that's something the Israelis are, are, are very eager to avoid. Okay. All right. So um, uh, that's sort of, I guess, in the short term, it's all going to sort of depend on how Israel d decides to respond here. Um, you know, both of these countries, as you've outlined, they're dealing with, with lots of other issues, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I I Israel's still trying to, you know, finish the, the its, its operations there uh, in Gaza. Um, uh, Iran, as you said, you know, has issues with Pakistan and other other areas around it, right? Knows that Russia can't really rush to its defense militarily as much as it might have been able to in the past. Um, so, if you had to bet, and and your world as a geopolitical analyst is all about probabilities. There's no guarantees about anything. Um, do do you think that this will? Yeah, there'll be a dust up for a while, but cooler heads will prevail, and and folks will go back to focusing on the other issues that they're dealing with. Or do you think that this really does have is looking like it could could spiral higher? I I tend to think the the imperatives of Israel and Iran favor a finding a path to de-escalation, to finding a way to get away from this conflict that neither side really welcomes, other than you know the politicians trying to look tough um, and the and the generals that are concerned about deterrence. I think that they both will have will will try to find a way to get back to that. It's just so unstable, that path. It's like trying to cross a bridge, you know, a wooden bridge, one of those rickety, you know, uh, rope bridges where, say, every third plank has been removed. And, and you can see it, you know it, um, but the longer you cross that bridge, the more likely you are to make a mistake. And, and I think that's where we're at, is that both sides are going to try to find a way to continue to reshape their military relationship, their cycle of deterrence and, and, and covert action against one another. And it will be very easy for either side to make a mistake. And in this case, it's more likely that the Israelis will make a mistake because they are more hawkish right now. Um, part of that's political, but it's the result of, of the October 7th attack. And I'm thinking about as, as, as Americans after 9-11, uh, the U.S. carried out an invasion of Iraq in spite of the fact that they weren't tied to what happened on 9-11. That was part of the politics of the moment. And so the Israelis are in a similar mindset, and it will last that long until one, there's a government change, and two, enough time has passed from October 7th where Israel can kind of reset its public mood and get away from that hawkish approach. So the idea of the Israelis potentially overreacting or miscalculating, I think, is high enough to warrant, you know, essentially for, for your, your financial audiences, you know, thinking of pricing in the idea of overt conflict, of being prepared for the, the, the worst is not off the table and won't be off the table until there's a resolution to the Gaza conflict. Um, nobody wants the worst. Everybody can see the worst, but it is possible to get there uh, through mistakes and 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 um, you know a combination of mistakes and misfortunes. So bad luck and bad planning uh, can cause conflicts that that nobody particularly wants. Okay, and I know that you're a geopolitical analyst and not so much an economic analyst. But w what's your general assessment of how the current tensions in the Middle East, leading up to this weekend and post this weekend, are having on the, the global economy and our global financial markets. And I think it's going to be the effects of, of the, the, the threat to the Strait of Hormuz. It's, it's Iran's preference to squeeze the global economy a bit, but not to upend it. Because after all, if they close the Strait of Hormuz, uh, the U.S. will send an aircraft carrier there to reopen it and probably destroy what remains of Iran's air force along the way and Iran's navy along the way. Um, so they don't want to do that. They don't want to go to the full tilt. What they want to do is a softer version of what the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea without provoking a coalition response like we've seen from the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, in the Red Sea. So that's where I think the, the greatest, most tangible risk is right now is that squeeze on yet another supply chain point, um, you know, upward pressure on energy prices, upward pressure on, on insurance premiums for shipping and tanking and tankers going through that part of the world, um, the potential of airlines. Uh, we already saw, I think, EasyJet Easy decided that they're not going to fly to Israel until October. Other airlines may take similar decisions or they may change their flight paths. That's going to push up the price of, of, of flights. Um, shifts in tourism, of course, throughout the region. Um, shifts in investment patterns. You know, people are going to be very skeptical 
to invest in Saudi Arabia, for example, or the United Arab Emirates, if they believe that a regional war may un upend all of that. So things like that could slow down. So I think it's a game of pressure and it's a question of what events take place that accelerates or decelerates that pressure. I think people will get used to that pressure over the coming weeks, especially if we enter you know, a more realistic conflict scenario where Iran's firing missiles, Israel's airstrikes, Iran's firing missiles, airstrikes, and it's similar to what we're seeing with the Houthis um, in Yemen between the Houthis and the US. Um, that hasn't resulted in a, a, a massive war. It's still a significant military campaign, but it's not a massive war and it's putting pressure on supply chains. It's not breaking them. Uh, it, it's putting, an, you know, making it so that inflation isn't quite tameable. Uh, it's one more factor that makes inflation not quite tameable in the near term, but it's not the sole driver of that entire phenomenon. And I think that's where we're, where we're potentially going, um, is that upward pressure until we kind of heat, hit a ceiling where some of those price pressures might cause demand destruction. And then we might see an adjustment uh, in res as a result of, uh, of, of that. Okay, and folks, I'm, I'm about to go to the live chat to start taking your questions. So if you have questions here for Ryan, uh, start asking them there. Um, Ryan, just wrapping up with you on my own line of questioning here. Um, I, I got to imagine that this is kind of like one of the last things the Biden administration kind of wants happening right now um, for a whole bunch of reasons, but one being what you talked about where, you know, it is putting uh, additional pressure on keeping inflation stickier for longer uh, at a time where, you know, they're really hoping that cost of living is going to come down before the election enough that it won't be as much of a voting issue. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. That's that's certainly one of the the uh, the major imperatives for the Biden administration. It's one, they're looking at their left flank, of course, the grassroots activists. And there's been a whole generational and social shift on Israel that has made criticism of Israel easier to do and has allowed a lot more of uh, democratic activists to take a lot more of a of a, a, you know, not anti-Israel stance, but a, we need to reshape this relationship stance. Although in some cases, you know, on the, especially on the left, it's an anti-Israel stance. Um, so they've got to watch for their left flank. They also have to watch for their center flank of people who are looking at cost of living issues. And um, the idea of, of, a, of a crisis in the Strait of Hormuz, even if it's only for a few days where there's a threat of a crisis in the Strait of Hormuz, could cause gas prices to skyrocket. And if that happens, say, in October, that's certainly not something the Biden administration wants to see. So they want to find a, a way to bring tensions down, reestablish a level of deterrence from all sides. Um, and that's, you know, you can see some of that actions with why they were so assertive in shooting down so much of Iran's drones. They're trying to signal to Iran that you can fire as many drones as you want. The U.S. is going to block them all. You're not going to get the the over-the-top psychotic response that you want out of the Israelis, you're just using up your drones that should be going to your Russian allies anyway. Um, and and uh, that's the signal that they're trying to signal to, uh, to, to send to the Iranians is that further escalation is, is um, in a certain sense, futile. Okay. And that, that kind of gets to the final question I was going to ask you, um, which maybe you've now answered, but if there's more to it, put it on here, which is, what will it take to de-escalate the situation? Like what specific strategies and tactics do you see all the players taking? The uh, the certain answer I've got for that, the core answer to how this all ends is something, the, the, the Gaza war comes to an end. And that comes to an end either through Israel capturing and killing all the Hamas leaders and suppressing them and, and essentially reoccupying the Gaza Strip. Um, that will end all the political incentive for everybody to escalate on their behalf once that that, that situation is Result. It could also be a diplomatic outcome in, in Gaza where, you know, the Israelis withdraw or Hamas surrenders and goes into exile. There's all of those options. But if that happens, then the region will start to calm back down again, because that's the core driver of this. The other ways that you can mitigate the tension over the, you know, short and medium term is through all of these signals, these diplomatic signals that could be sent, especially from Washington um, and from Europe towards Israel to restrain itself from further escalation and trying to convince the Israelis that in spite of the public mood after October 7th, there are limits to what Israel is, is going to get support for uh, in, in its, its confrontation with Iran. Iran right now is, is willing to go back to the status quo. They said as much that they'll go back to the status quo that they've now reshaped in their favor, um, having launched their barrage and saying, we're not going to fire anything more unless the Israelis reply. So you can end up in this unstable detente situation where Iran and Israel are still eyeing each other warily, um, but under US pressure for the Israelis, and of course a lot of internal pressure uh, for the Iranians, neither side decides to pick a fight 
Again, the liability of that, that's not a resolution. That's just conflict management. That's keeping two, you know, squabbling um, divorcees in the hotel room talking, uh, even though most of their talks, you know, most of their, their exchanges are insults. Um, you can call it a success because they're still in the same place. But at the end of the day, you're, you're still setting up the stage for another explosion later down the line. Okay. All right. Uh, well, folks, we're now going to get to your questions. Um, uh, and, and folks, if you like this format of bringing on uh, an expert uh, like Ryan here about important breaking developments, would like to see more of this on timely topics going forward, let me know in the live chat as well if there's enough demand. Obviously, we'll try to repeat this going forward. By the way, Ryan, I, I've really been enjoying this and valuing this. This is wonderful. Would love to have you come back on the program again in the future um, to update us you know, along the way is this important, uh, this important situation hopefully resolves, but however it evolves from here. Um, I'd be happy to, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Oh, thanks. Okay, well, look, um, you might not appreciate it after we get to some of these questions. Some of these questions are rough. <laughs> <can imagine>. uh, <laughs> let's see here. Um, where's the one I saw? Um, I mean, some of these are crazy. This, this one is, is, a little more rational, but but not super easy. Uh, Carlos asks, why does Israel, a very small country, have so much influence on our foreign policy? Um, no, and that's a great question. These are great fundamental questions as to why do, especially people perceive like Israel is able to get a lot out of the United States the way that, say, Saudi Arabia, another way, arguably Saudi Arabia is more important, especially for our energy security, but the Saudis were carrying out their war in Yemen. The U.S. didn't like it. And the U.S. more or less put pressure on the Saudis to de-escalate that situation uh, to the point where there's now peace talks between the Saudis and their rivals, the Houthis. Um, so why doesn't Israel get that same treatment? One, um, it is ideological. Uh, the U.S. has had this current of, of Americans that have been interested in the Holy Land since the foundation of the Republic. There's a place in Jerusalem called the American Colony that was founded in the early 19th century by a bunch of missionaries who during the Ottoman Empire era wanted to show up and, and kind of like remake this utopia. And so there's this religious attachment to the status of Israel that is very deep in America's political and ideological DNA. Uh, and they want to see the outcome of it. So it's political in a lot of senses. Um, that has manifested now, of course, through largely the Republican Party, but certainly substantial parts of the Democratic Party are also there, um, where there's political support for Israel and it gets a, a special relationship that other countries don't. But the other reason is one, as I said before, Israel is a nuclear weapons power. What happens to Israel's security can easily destabilize and cause a nuclear reaction that the United States and nobody wants. The US can't get rid of those nukes. Um, that's one of the reasons Israel is not going to go anywhere either as a country. Um, there's people that would like to abolish Israel. You're not gonna abolish a nuclear weapons power. Um, and so with that reality in mind, a lot of American foreign policy is about preventing escalation from the Israelis on the most extreme side. Um, in 1973, one of the reasons the U.S. was prepared to intervene against the Soviet Union was because the Israelis were preparing their nuclear option against the Egyptians, uh, because the Egyptians were about to overrun their country, uh, where they believed they were. So there's also that tangible side of things. So there's an ideological side, there's a tangible side of things. Um, Israel is also a superb intelligence partner, Par bar none, the Mossad is the most reliable intelligence partner of the United States in the Middle East. Um, it is also a major tech power that Israel gains a lot out of. Um, it has a lot of defense connections with the United States that while U.S. taxpayers pay for that, um, Israel, this war just proved the idea of what Reagan was talking about back in the 80s of shooting down ballistic missiles in space. They did exo-atmospheric interceptions this weekend. She shot down ballistic missiles in space, nuclear capable or theoretically nuclear capable ballistic missiles in space using Israeli technology. Obviously the United States very much wants that. Um, so there is that relationship on the defense side that's very substantial too. All right. Um, this is a terrible, this, uh, I'm sorry to ask you this. I've been sitting in this um, conference 25 years, something like that. It's 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 always rough. No so I'm worries, I, used to it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna restate this question a little bit here. But but this questioner is asking: Do Palestinians have the right to exist? And and the reason why I'm bringing this up here is not trying to inflame, but but we we have this, you know, obviously intractable issue uh, in in the state of Israel, where basically you have two parties that feel like. <laughs> 
they have a heritage claim to it, right? Um, and uh, you know, there are there are, I mean, the Palestinians still alive who remember being basically pushed out of uh, their homes uh, in 1948, I think, um, uh, or 67. I, I, you, you know the history better than I do of exactly what, what transpired where there. But, um, you know, these are still very raw claims um, to, to, to many of the parties. Um, it, it, is there a way to actually find a sustainable resolution here that pleases enough parties to, to make it something that can, can last for the ages? Or is this just going to be a, you know, a, a, an ever volatile, ever non-resolved uh, situation? Um, and the short answer to that is in the short term, no, because it's an ideological conflict. And to resolve an ideological conflict, you either need a decisive victory, which in this case is brutal. It's ethnic cleansing and or genocide uh, is the is the only way you can resolve an ideological conflict over land. One side has to exterminate or push out the other. Uh, and that's history that goes all the way back to humanity's beginnings. That's how people resolve. Uh, this is my land. This is my land. They, they wipe each other out. Um, that's one, of course, brutal resolution that the international community doesn't really want to see. Uh, but we are seeing a resurrection of that tactic being utilized in places. Azerbaijan um, took over an enclave of Armenians within its own territory and has ethnically cleansed them. That happened last September. Uh, the Russians have obviously ethnically cleansed a fair bit of Ukrainians. Uh, the Chinese are, are reshaping the Uyghur culture in Western uh, Western China. Um, there's been significant genocides and, and, and mass ethnic cleansings in places like Sudan. Ethiopia, and that's just this decade. Um, we went through a very brief period in the 90s and in the 2000s, where attempting to do the never again pledge of the Holocaust had some teeth, particularly in the Balkans, where the US and NATO were willing to intervene militarily to halt ethnic cleansing campaigns. In the multipolar world, there is very limited appetite for most countries to intervene on that front and particularly for the West, where a lot of people are arguing America is not the world policeman and shouldn't be, and money should be spent better at home, et cetera, et cetera. And that as a result is opening up space for these sort of brutal resolutions of, of conflicts. Now, that being said, within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the way you get to a resolution is an ideological change that takes place and is holding on both sides. And essentially, this is a problem of far-right factions on, on both sides. Now, Israel's current government is the most far right in its history. It has a party called Otzma Yehudit in it. Uh, Otzma Yehudit it means Jewish power, as in white power. Uh, it is a openly, explicitly uh, Jewish supremacist political faction who believe that Jewish Arabs or Israeli Arabs, who make up about 10% of the Israeli population, uh, aren't real Israelis, should have their rights stripped away from them, etc. So there's a brutal um, ideological ascent within Israel's political spectrum from these far-right factions. They need to be discredited, defeated at the polls. Um, Israelis need to change their minds about supporting them. They need to move away from the far right. On the Palestinian side, they don't have elections, which is a huge problem. Um, there's no chance for Palestinians to exercise political rights or develop civic culture uh, in a way that they can debate these things more openly and more thoroughly through you know, uh, the way that, we, that uh, people do in, in, in democratic systems. Um, but they have to deal with their own far-right faction, which is Hamas, Palestinian and Islamic Jihad, the militant factions who are essentially also far-right groups. They are um, they believe in, in, in the destruction of Israel and the replacement of it with an Islamist Arab state, not a democratic state, but an Islamist, um, you know, hardline, far-right state. Um, and as long as those groups have grassroots supporters on either sides, one of those sides is going to drive the conflict. Now, of the two, the Israelis have more power than the Palestinians to change facts on the ground, but they are not all powerful. They can't change hearts and minds uh, inside of the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip uh, in a perfect way. They can certainly do policy changes that would that would certainly weaken the far right's influence in Palestine. But until that changes, we are likely still stuck in this cycle of violence. So, and, and, and that's you know. We have seen ideological change before the Soviet Union fell apart because its ideology exhausted itself. It does happen. It can happen. Re reconciliation is possible, uh, but that's really what we need to see. Okay. And from a hearts and minds standpoint, you, you mentioned earlier that when a country comes under attack, it, it generally leads to solidarity with the ruling regime. Um, what is happening right now in Gaza with the average person's allegiances? Are, are they... 
are, are they becoming more sympathetic with Hamas because, hey, we're getting bombed by the Israelis? Or are they saying, hey, you guys caused this Hamas and we need to come up with different leaders? Multiple things are happening. We have seen a few reports of anti-Hamas protests in mm -hmm. Gaza from folks that are, you know, and Hamas gunmen and other militants and criminal gangs have grabbed the, the international aid uh, out from under civilians' hands. Uh, a few times. That's been documented a few times. Um, and that's produced protests and, and blaming of Hamas. There's also a lot of support, though, for Hamas, in particular because of the, the Israeli reaction. Israel's uh, military doctrine is very um, focused on protecting their own forces uh, to the point where civilian infrastructure is, is fair game as far as they're concerned. Um, right. that's say, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but just so your answer can include this. Is the Israeli response right now all stick or are they offering some sort of carrot to try to, you know, show there's an alternate way here to engage with Israel? They're offering a carrot, but it's not a terribly viable one. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to find Palestinians who will work with the Israelis and help distribute aid who are not affiliated with Hamas. Um, they're looking at clans and families within Gaza, particularly in the northern part of Gaza. They're looking at uh, local community leaders where they're hoping they can channel aid through them. That is not terribly effective because Hamas had control of Gaza for such a long time. It's hard to find anybody with any competency that doesn't have some association uh, with that group. Um, the other problem is that that kind of opens the door to corruption because these families could just hoard the, the, the aid and, and, and there's no mechanisms for necessarily overseeing whether or not it's being distributed equitably. Um, the Israelis aren't doing the really fundamental political solution that needs to be done for Gaza. They essentially just say, when Hamas is in, you know, surrenders, defeats, comes to a negotiation, the political status of Gaza will be X. And they are refusing to articulate that, mostly for political reasons for the current government. Um, and that is making it so that it's hard to have any carrots if nobody knows what the status of Gaza is going to be. Is it going to be reoccupied by Israel? Are the settlements going to come back? Is the Palestinian Authority, which is the, the governing authority of the West Bank, are they going to run the, th the, the affairs? Is the UN going to run it? Um, nobody has that answer because the Israelis are right now uh, choosing not to give it. Okay. Um... I'm going to get to one last user question, but but your last sentence there makes me want to ask this. Um, what is what is the likelihood slash what is your opinion of something like the UN running it? You you have sort of a quote unquote neutral party in there trying to help with rebuilding and you know providing some sort of safety buffer. Um, is that likely to happen? Is that a pipe dream? That's probably a pipe dream in part because the UN runs Southern Lebanon nominally. And it, really, they don't run Le southern Lebanon, actually. Uh, they have forces there, but they can't stop the fighting. Um, they haven't got a, they've been, the UN is very good at a lot of your Cold War things, like the UN that's watching Egypt and Israel for the, the, the peace treaty. That's pretty effective. They're really bad at this asymmetric stuff. They don't know, the international architecture doesn't exist to figure out what to do with a militia or a state within a state like Hamas um, or Palestinian Islamic Jihad or any of these militants. They don't know how to react to them. Now, on the other hand, could an international coalition go into Gaza led by countries like, say, Saudi Arabia and Turkey and, and the United Arab Emirates, countries that are either have working relations with the Israelis or are warm to the Israelis? That's a possibility, I think, in the longer term. But you need to see political change in Israel. Essentially, the, the Netanyahu government has to fall and be replaced by a fresh election of, of somebody else uh, to make that sort of thing work uh, on the Israeli side. Okay, and, and what is happening right now inside Israel with the Netanyahu government? Uh, is support rising, falling? Yeah, that, the, the man has, a, has an approval rating of like 10 to 15%. Uh, any election is, is fatal for him. So he's very desperate to keep the government together, which means keeping the emergency going for as long as possible. Um, he keeps the emergency going by refusing to articulate what's going to happen to Gaza. That's the one place that he has the leverage to keep uh, the emergency feeling moving. Uh, but it also has fed into some of the slow walking of, of military tactics in Gaza, why the IDF hasn't taken over what is a, what is essentially geographically a rather small space uh, in spite of the fact that they've been you know fighting for six months. So he's trying to drag it out as long as he can. Okay. Um, all right. Last user question here. Um, you've already sort of explained where you see the situation going, but to his point of you know, opportunities, risks and opportunities from an investment standpoint, if your predictions come to fruition, are there are there anything that come to your mind? And again, you're not an economic analyst and this is not personal financial advice, but are you thinking like, wow, oil looks like it's going to have some upward pricing pressure or, you know, a lot of people think gold's recent spike is due to concerns about what's going on there. Don't want to put words in your mouth, but but do you have any anything to share with viewers? So, I mean, the broadest risks from an investment standpoint, and again, I apologize because we don't always um, provide that kind of advice. So I'll, I'll just kind of speak broadly. 
Upward pressure on energy prices, I think, is is one of your biggest risks. Um, possibly an opportunity, depending on how you trade. But upward prices, you know, upward pressure on energy prices. Those will be highly reactive to events on the ground. Um, the ones that will drive that the furthest is an Israeli strike on Iranian territory. That will probably cause energy to be pushed upward um, because it, it means that Iran's going to fire back, um, and that again would also cause energy to be pushed upward. Um, the stance of, of the Gulf Arab states is also going to matter on that front, um, especially if Iran starts to threaten them directly or starts to threaten the Strait of Hormuz uh, directly. Again, that causes that energy price to, to be pushed up. Some supply chain interruptions, I think, are possible. You know, you could have civilian cargo uh, airliners that are having to reroute, especially if places like the UAE and Saudi Arabia no longer have necessarily safe airspace. And Al Maktoum Airport in, in Dubai is a major cargo hub. Um, you know, so is uh, Qatar's Hamad Airport is also a major a cargo hub. So those sort of interruptions are also possible. Um, the idea that countries like Saudi Arabia, where it's really pushing for this Vision 2030 diversification that's supposed to attract substantial investment, that investment could slow or it could be only localized um, from Gulf Arab states. Um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that while Western, or I should say, you know, technocratic investors are going to look at the situation from a dollars and cents standpoint, your strategic investors from groups like the Saudi Public Investment Fund, the PIF, they will be looking at things from the geopolitical lens. So they will be putting money into countries like Jordan, like Egypt themselves, uh, to make sure that their economies keep going, that they're the public of those countries remains, you know, at least loyal enough in the in the case of places like Jordan um, to prevent instability. So just because we might have instability in the region doesn't mean that say investment flows stop but that the sources of them probably change and are, are driven by strategic calculations from your Gulf Arab states that at the end of the day see money as a means to an end rather than an end in and of itself. All right. Um, God, just fascinating. All right. Well, look, Ryan, um, we're, we're going to start wrapping it up here. Thank you again for doing this. Um, from what I'm seeing in the chat here, folks have really enjoyed this, very much valuing your, your expertise. Uh, so, folks, we will continue to do this again for future breaking developments. Um, Ryan, for folks that have really enjoyed this discussion, for most, I, I imagine it's their first time um, hearing you, where can they go to follow you and your work? Um, right now, I'm using a lot of LinkedIn to promote uh, to promote work. So I'm more than welcome to follow me on, on, on that. I, I'm still on X. I don't, I'm not as active on that as I used to be, but I'm still there and occasionally we'll chime in there. Um, I'm also on threads, which is we're trying um, with that. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's not always a place where where my work necessarily gets gets traction. Um, but I mean, yeah, LinkedIn is where I do a lot of the whenever I do interviews with television or anybody else, I tend to post it there and I tend to post articles there as well. Um, and of course, you can visit our website where my assessments are Part of a broader team effort that rainnetwork.com right there um, right. where you can get yourself a, a sign up for a, you know an exploratory account see if our content is something that is valuable for you fantastic all right folks well look please uh please give ryan a big thanks both in the live comments there but also by hitting the like button and while you're doing that click the red subscribe button and that little bell icon right next to it and just a reminder uh for all things uh, thoughtful money our free newsletter uh our um uh, you know, free consultations with the financial advisors to, to you know, if you've been motivated by some of the things that Ryan said here, talk them through with your professional financial advisor. If we don't have a good one, feel free to talk for free to one of the ones we endorse to do that. Obviously, all that stuff can be done just at thoughtfulmoney.com. Um, Ryan, real pleasure. Like I said, really look forward to having you back on again in the future. Um, you know, I'll, I'll reach out at some point, but if something in the interim happens that is changing your point of view, please reach out to me. We'll pull you back on the program. We'll do the same thing all over again. Absolutely. I really appreciate it, Adam. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, my pleasure. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.